Gig Gab, episode 304 for Thursday, May 20th, 2021. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. If it could be something else for working musicians, it would be that too. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. Back in Napomo, California, even. Yeah, we took a little jaunt out to the desert and stayed in Vegas for a couple of days. That's awesome. Kind of fun. You know, things are definitely opening up there. There were a couple of bands playing on the uh, strip and... And uh, not no events in the casinos quite yet, but I sure. hear that that's coming pretty soon. That makes sense. Yeah. Oh, so you get to see some live music. That's good. That's good. Yeah. 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 So life is life is inching its way back to normal. That's yes, it is. I um I got to play with Bitter Pill last weekend. We 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 played our um, beer release party at Corner Point Brewery. Our Bitter Pills release a uh, party for the beer that they created in our name, which was such a cool thing. Uh, I'll say hello to Barry who came out from Chicago to, to uh, hey, Barry. enjoy the band and the beer. So that was good. Yep. Uh, and um, I got to use a new mic for my pitch slap at this gig. I had talked on the show about how I had previously used a sure it was a PGA or it is a PGA 98 H XLR. And it's a clip-on mic like you might put on a, a saxophone horn or bell, right? And yeah. uh, to fit that in the pitch slap, I actually had to jury rig something. I actually used a guitar capo that I, I put the part that would go over your fretboard uh, on the inside of the pitch slap. And then I clipped the mic to that because the, the wood of the pitch slap is too thick to hold the clip or for the clip to hold onto it. And... Um, the pitch slap being this cajon that I use, I, I, I say it like everybody knows what I mean when I say it, <laughs> it's a, it, I, it's it pitch slap is the brand. Uh, I have their table dance cajon, which is a tabletop cajon that they put some, they screwed some guitar pegs into for me so I can wear it and stand up with it. And if you've ever seen pictures of me or even seen me live, that's what it is. And I put a little mic in, in one of the sound holes and it sounds great. But um, listener Dan East, who is also a uh, multi time guest here on the show suggested I check out the buyer dynamic TGD 57, which has a bigger clip on it. And, um, it's a, it's a condenser. It's got a good tight cardioid pattern and the clip works great. The mic works fairly well. I, I it's interesting. The EQ for a saxophone seems to be a better natural EQ than the EQ for say a Tom, which is what this, particular mic might be used for, uh, at least just inside the, the sound hole of the cajon. So I had to, I had to add, I had to scoop some mids out of it. It seemed a little bit mid rangey, but, and when I say scoop some, it was like 60 B of mids out. It was quite a bit, but, um, but once I dialed it in, man, it stayed on the the thing. I was really Very stoked cool. about it. Yeah. 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 I was really excited. So it's Wanna yeah. hear a funny one. Yeah, man, I do. So uh, House Rockers had their rehearsals, and so uh, we're getting back and ready to go, and maybe a, a conversation for a, an upcoming episode, all that was expressed and and learned and, and grooved. In general, they were great and was so wonderful just to be moving forward. But one thing that funny that came out of it is, you know, Nick, my keyboard player, right? Sure. So Nick uh, has a side project. And it's a it's a Zappa tribute band. I've I've called, talked to Nick about this. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Called the the Stinkfoot Orchestra, and uh, I like it. He yep. He's sixteen pieces, and one of the pieces is is a mallet player, and he's trying to figure out the most accurate way to mic the mallets. And he has a he says the way Zappa did it, the way he wants to see to do it is if he could put a piezo mic under each bar of the mallets and then mix them huh. and send one out, which seems overly <laughs> ambitious, you know, and ripe with, with uh, fail possibilities. Oh right? my gosh. Like that sounds like, how would, that doesn't sound like it realistic if for like moving from gig to gig, venue to venue, you know, you've got, even if you have several hours to set up, like that's, right. that's a, that's a full time 
job for one person at the gig to manage that. There you go. Yeah. Yep. Is this a marimba that he's, he's miking? I would assume. I, I, I mean, know. I would I don't, assume. I don't know. That, yeah. I don't know technically what it's called. He, he calls them mallets. Well, you would so play you know a marimba that. with like mallets. A, like, a, like a giant xylophone. Right. But I don't think it's metal. I think it's wood. I, if, if, if I'm thinking of what Ruth played, I think she played marimba. Um, so um, in, in Zappa's band, if I'm not incorrect, I could be incorrect about that. But anyway, yeah, it seems like you might, I mean, I've mic'd a marimba with two or even three condensers sort of aimed in the right way that probably would get enough of sure. the sound. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. Would think so too. Yeah. Yeah. But if you know my brother, Nick, you know that I do. Like, yes. Compli complicated is the goal. So. He's like me, right? He, if he, if you can make it more complex, well, you know, if it ain't broke, fix it till it is right. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Oh. So we had our first fling rehearsal too. How did, how did your house rockers rehearsal go? We had three in a row. We Ooh, had a, a full wow. band rehearsal. Okay. Yeah. We had a full band rehearsal, a vocal rehearsal, and a, another full band rehearsal. So what we've done is we've taken, we, uh, of the 200 songs that we probably have, two plus, sure. what we've, our plan to reopen is we created an A-list and we're going to say, this is going to be our, our show for the near future. This is, you know, so everybody has this list. It's, you know, about 45 songs and we'll do about 15 songs per the three rehearsals, plus a couple of vocal only rehearsals, right? Sure. So we did, we did, we did the first 15, the second 15 last week. The first rehearsal was sublimely awesome. Like, right. like some combination of preparation and muscle memory that created this nirvana and happiness to just be practicing together again. Of course. And it was like we were looking around the room, like, is this really happening? <laughs> it, was, it was so good. It was awesome. Um, vocal rehearsal similarly was really, really good. And I'm, I am, I'm marveling at what mu muscle memory does. I mean, again, remember some of these songs we've been playing for you know, quite a while. Yeah. Um, and you know, we get enough repetitions every year, quite a while that, um, they should be sunk in and they really were. And it kind of felt that way when I was doing my personal prep, like, Oh yeah, maybe, maybe four or five of the songs I, I relearned better parts, you know, took the opportunity to, you know, fix a couple of things and, you know, and that was really fun and rewarding to hear that. And it was funny because most of the parts that I relearned a couple Stevie wonder and a couple of earth, wind and fire songs, they, um, created even more space in the songs. And, you know, in a 10 piece band yeah. space is at a premium yeah. and it's incredibly effective when you let it breathe like that. Right. Yep. Like filling up every, every, you know, sonic possibility uh, is fun, but um, in the, in serving the song, you know, more uh, restraint. And so going back and learning actually the exact part to I wish was really, really fun. And, and it did make the song pop and feel fresh and, you know, all those types of things That's from great. how we had been playing it for so long. No, so that, it, that, it those is good. Kind of cool. It's good to do that even like without a pandemic giving you a break in the middle. Right. Like, you, you know, I, I find myself occasionally I'll hear, you know, a, the original version of a song that we cover on the radio, you know, and it's like, oh, wow we've really changed it from there. <laughs> like, you know, because these things happen, you're either playing it faster, you, you've changed the groove. And some of those things are good to keep, right? Because they're yours yeah. and, and they're what work for your band. And that's always an important metric to, you know, light to shine on things. But at the same time, you're like, oh, I forgot about that cool little thing. Or I'm overplaying here. I think I could play less. Like, you know, that kind that's of thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah, cool. sometimes it's just different and sometimes it's better, sometimes it's sure. worse. I mean, that's, right. that's part of the fun of it, right? Yep. But um yep. the other thing is we used a fairly recent audio recording mm. that I shared with everybody if they needed any help, you know, remembering stuff. And um, you know, we found that we play things fairly briskly and and I think everybody was very conscious listening to that. Like, why do we play that so fast? And everything was at a, and you know, I let, I, I asked Russ to set tempos a lot more. I typically count so songs off, but even the ones I don't, that's not me. Mm. You know, we, I don't know if you remember that when you played with us, did you feel that we pushed tempos? Yeah, but everybody does. Even, even bands like, like playing their original tunes, you know, they, like live is usually faster regardless. Um, but you, you know, you have to be conscious of, 
where does the speed help the music? Because sometimes it makes sense to add a little bit of tempo to, to keep the energy up live. Right. And other times it can spoil the groove. So it like, it's not universally bad to well, have check the this tempo out. faster. I don't ever remember them feeling fast and they always feel good in the moment and right. feel like there's a lot well, of energy. However, yeah. going back and listening to them later, you're like, what were we thinking? You well, you're, you're not I mean, in the adrenaline of the moment. Like that's the problem right. with that is, is you will play them at different tempos any, on any given night. If it's up to you to set those tempos, you know, I, I find if there's a song that I've, I've learned is problematic. I will not just count it from memory from like mental memory, I will count it from physical memory. And I literally get my body moving like, you know, okay, like here's the thing and you clap and you know, okay, yep, there, that's where we want to be. All right, now one, two, three, four, right? You know, and, and, and you're in. But feeling it, taking a breath to feel the tempo of a tune, man, it's, it, you know, you, we're all, the show must keep going. I don't want to say the show must go yeah. on. That means something different, but the show must keep going. Dead air is bad. Right. But yeah. you know, taking a breath to find the tempo I've found is often uh, well worth it because if you come in, you know, if you start a song too fast, slowing a song down is way harder than speeding a song up once you've got it going. Um, especially if you're responsible for people out there dancing. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you know of a song that's, that's, a, that's a problem, it's like, okay, just take a breath. It doesn't have to be, you know, a minute, it, you know, 10 seconds is often all it takes to just settle in and find it. Okay. Now let's count it and go. So that was, yeah. Yeah. A lesson I learned from, uh, Rick Castillo, who was a bass player in, uh, the responders when I very first joined that band. Uh, but he learned it from Barry Tashin. Uh, when he played with him, uh, with, you know, Barry mm. from Barry and the Remains. And he's like, mm. oh, that dude, he's like, it didn't matter how many people were in the room. That dude would get his body moving and then count off a song. And it's like, mm. yeah, that's an interesting lesson. So, yeah. Well, I'm glad your rehearsals went well. That's good, man. Yeah. Very exciting. We got two more coming up in June. So we're going to, a couple of weeks, um, we're, we're thinking of doing something kind of cool. I mean, most of the, I have a few house rocker fans who listen to this for some reason. They like the inside baseball aspects of listening to what we do. Of course. But by and large, I know that our audience is, you know, musicians around the world. And so we're going to, you know, in the interest of doing things fun and marketing e and stealthy, we're going to do the next two rehearsals um, at a public place. Mm -hmm. We're not going to announce them as open to the public. The first one will probably invite very close friends and family, uh, but it's a, it's a brewery and it's going to be open to the public. And, sure. um, and then we may, you know, stealthily let it leak out, you know, that, uh, that the, another one is going to happen. So it's a Thursday and Friday night. So the Thursday one, we still have the third set to do. And then the, the next one is going to be the full show. So, um, you know, just to create a little excitement in the community and, you know, let people know we're back That's in an interesting man. way. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, let you kind of, let you kind of step back into it a little bit. That's good. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Yeah. So yeah, we're on our way. How about your rehearsals? How'd they go? Oh, uh, we've had one, uh, you know, Mike, Russ and I, so three fifths of fling have been getting together since January, which is something for which I am infinitely thankful. Uh, you know, we were all on the UNH testing plan and we were, cause we all teach there and variety. Like those guys are actually teachers. I'm, I just, play one once a week, but, um, you know, we were able to do that. And and then now with everybody all vaxxed and comfortable, we were able to get everybody together here. The first time the fling five was together since March of 2020. And it actually went really well. Like we, we played well, we basically played only fling originals, which was a really nice thing to do and, and really kind of mm. dig into some of those. We learned some news. We, well, we played some originals that, the five of us had not played together yet, uh, which was pretty cool. And just, you know, it was, it was great to have that fling feeling again, you know, singing together, uh, you know, and I, I, I will, I love Mike, but I will, I will, I'm not going to pick on him. This isn't me picking on him, although it will come across that way. <laughs> the, the, you know, all the little nuances that happen when five people know each other so well that then, and, and with Mike, it, you know, the one that comes to mind is the moment where he took a guitar solo, but as 
would occasionally happen at gigs. He would forget to hit his boost pedal and, you know, his guitar solo level would be too low. Right. And he'd be like, Mike, you got to turn on your boost pedal. So like those sorts of things, like, Oh, I, I actually kind of missed this. I mean, there were some moments where I was really frustrated by that over the years, but that day it was like, Oh, that's so endearing. Like, here we are. It's us. Like, this is great. So that, that was kind of nice. Um, the, the one, the one different thing is that, um, I've convinced, I believe, all the other members of Fling, but certainly at that rehearsal, everybody but Burke um, was on in-ears. And I, like everybody seems to really get the the benefit of it. And I'm I'm stoked about this. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, it's excellent to see. I don't know how often Fling's going to play live and whether this will matter, but, uh, for a live show, but in the rehearsal room, you know, it's nice not to have monitor wedges, you know, filling up the room with sound. It's just yeah. like, yeah, it really, it makes a difference. And I, and obviously anybody that's moving to in ears, the, the place to learn to do it is in the rehearsal room, not on stage, right? Like you definitely want to get your, so much sense. get your stuff together. And I, um, I had the opportunity to test out. I'd been using here, even though I have my, my custom fit ultimate ears, I just sort of left those in my, my gig bag. And for the last year here in the studio, I, I think I mentioned, I was using the Mackie, the, their MP series. I had their two forties, I, which are the dual driver, uh, hybrids. They call them. It's a, the low end is a dynamic driver and the high end is a balanced armature. I got the chance to check out their MP three twenties, which are triple dynamic drivers. And, I was so pleasantly surprised by how great even the high end stuff sounded for an in-ear monitor, like a, a monitor, not just listening to music, but actually using as a monitor um, on dynamic drivers. I, for whatever reason, over the years, I had, I had decided I preferred balanced armatures on stage as my, you know, for, as in-ears because they had a little more articulation to them. For listening to music, I definitely prefer dynamic drivers because they, they're speakers, right? They sound like you're listening to a speaker. But the way they've EQ'd these things, uh, it, I really was impressed listening to dynamic drivers. And it makes me think that I need to revisit and reconsider Future Sonics um, because that's been their whole thing all the way through with their, their in-ears is that um, they use dynamic drivers. And so now it makes me think maybe I've been missing out over the years. Mm. So I, you know, I, I love gear and I love like stuff. So that's, you know, that's me. Right. That's what you do. That's yeah. what I do. Yeah. We got a lot of email, man. Oh man. So a couple of things. I don't know if you know, you, you know, we haven't talked in, in over a week. Also the number of requests to join our Facebook page have been crazy. Like about yes. 35 in the last week. It's been Something great. happened that I don't know about. Uh, some of those are just scammers or whatever. So we send those packing, but, um, but yeah, there's some like real, you know, real musicians <laughs> and maybe even <laughs> some drummers, uh, joining the page. So yeah. uh, I see what you did there. You see what I did there. Um, no. yeah. So the first email that I want to share, I want to get to, we got a ton of feedback from y'all about the idea of transitioning to a wedding band. Uh, so I want to go through that, but the first thing I want to do is share Dave's email about, gig checklist editions because Paul, we missed some things and Dave good things. some good things. Yeah. So I'm just going to read through Dave's list. They are shoes. He says, you mentioned your shirt, but he says, I've done a lot of weddings or gigs where there's a specific dress code and it's easy to bring clothes and forget appropriate shoes. There's a reason I forgot shoes, Dave. I don't wear shoes when I play. That said, I do bring shoes to a wedding gig that are like nice looking shoes. I walk to the stage in them and then and then shed them. Uh, so, yes, great thing for the list. Gu guitar stand, a guitar strap, charging cables. He says, I use an iPhone or an iPod or an iPad or all three. And I bring cables and backup batteries for all of them just in case. That's smart. Uh, extra cables, including spare speaker cables. I would say add spare microphone cables to that. And along that line, extension cords for both power and audio and business cards for both the band and for you personally. So I like this. this. smart. I, I'm going to ask you, like, I know myself and most guitar players I know, the goal is to continue to get more and more compact in your, uh, in your rig, right? You know, that, of course. Like one... One trip from the car is the goal, right? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, right. Of course. Yeah. So I'm just thinking about these things and, you know, it reminds you that 
that that that goal that most guitar players have is at odds with the reality of truly be truly being prepared unless well, you figure out a way to get all these things compactly packed up together um you know there's a lot of spare things that i leave in stuff. my car like i have the, the my blue tub that i referred to as my security blanket box in the last episode that often not always but often stays in my car just so that it's somewhere nearby if we have a major problem I have extra stuff over there that I can go walk to and, you know, fix a problem. And now we're, we're back and rocking and everything's good. So maybe, maybe you can have your cake and eat it too. So, yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, some of the stuff stands stra well, straps. A lot of the stuff fits in the pockets of a gig bag and you know, that's, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, you know, I always keep my the business cards, you know, a good stack of them. Everyone in the band has some. So if anybody comes up, the likeliness of being able to find a business card pretty quickly is pretty good. Yeah. But it's a, it's a great addition to the list. So thanks, Dave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it, uh, it's good stuff. All right. So we have some things to talk about in terms of transitioning to a wedding band. And I, I, think, the, I think the way to start is at the very least to read one of the many emails we got. Hopefully we'll get through all of them. But, uh, but I want to start with Brian's email if that, if that works for you, Paul. Go for it. Okay. Brian says, uh, our band, Jimmy and the Hat Tricks, is a six-piece wedding band and party band with a DJ component that we do during the band's breaks at weddings. And the DJ team, a.k.a. DJ Hat, can and does go and do weddings on its own without the band on dates when some members of the band are otherwise unavailable or have dates blocked out. We found great success with this formula. Uh, he says, the band has been around with multiple lineup changes since 2006. And we've been doing weddings since 2010. In late 2009, maybe early 2010, he says, a wedding agency came and saw one of our shows and was immediately impressed and wanted to work with us and groom us to be a wedding band on their roster. As far as weddings and corporate bands go, we were not polished. We were a typical bar slash party band. The agency took us under their wing and guided us, and we put in a ton of work. We changed our look. We changed how we dressed at club and bar gigs even. Our wardrobe for weddings now has matching suits. We have new promo audio. We have professional video shoots that we did. We have new promo photos. We have a new website, new social media presence, and doing an overhaul and even additions of new material for dance sets, dinner hour, cocktail hour, and we've been doing unpaid bridal showcases, working with a dedicated sound company to ensure we have the means to provide sound and light reinforcement for all aspects of the weddings, separate systems for the ceremony, cocktail hour, and for dinner dancing. Uh, he says, as well as organizing a pay structure, tax structure, business plan, and much more. He says in 2016, after having been established for some time, uh, and have been essentially become pros at the wedding game, we left our agency, uh, and do things on our own now and are doing quite well. We're now a polished wedding band with multiple awards, great reviews, our own PA gear and lighting system, including separate systems for the three different facets that we mentioned, our own dedicated sound engineer who is an employee slash seventh member of the band, an LLC with five employees. Uh, two of them are partners in the LLC and then they, the other band members are employees of the LLC and a song list of close to 500 songs, updated promo materials, etc. We are happy with where we are and love being a wedding band, but it was a long process that took a lot of work to get to where we are. So, so this might be the, the best feedback yep. email we've ever gotten, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> it's so salient, so on point, so informative. I mean, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for this, Brian. I mean, it, it's really helpful. And as you're reading it back and after I read it the first time, you know, what strikes me is, Many bands wake up one day and say, we need to make more money. Let's be a wedding band. Right. And, and, and as if just by saying it, that's all that has to happen. And <laughs> the yes. amount of detail in this and, you know, his emphasis on, we did a lot of work. We had to change our image. We had to change our approach. That's so fascinating to me. And I think about, you know, my band, you know, my band has a little bit of a different perspective. We get our wedding work because people have seen us. They want, you know, they want to be able to say they hired a 10 P, you know, this fairly sure. well-known band in the lair. That that's basically our marketing pull. In our band, we have such a, you know, a a wide variety of perspectives on well, on dress. I mean, we've talked about dress on the show, you know, mm -hmm. 50 times, right? And, you know, there, there are guys who literally say, What does it matter what I dress like? 
if I play well, they, <laughs> that, that is that, that is their core belief. I get in, it. In what yeah. they're music, they're in, wrong, by the way. But that's I agree with. That. I I, I want to I, I I would like to put a pin in that because I have a whole conversation. I I know we've had it before, but I have a whole <laughs> new way to approach this that hit me recently, and I don't want to do it in this episode <laughs> because it'll take too much time. So right, uh, but yes, that's a, that's certainly an element of this. Yes, yeah. And, but the, the amount of things that Brian alludes to about the work you do, a 500 song list, song, song list, right? Yeah. You know, that somewhat implies that you have got to do a lot of work. You have got to, you know, be prepared for all these things. Um, you so know, I want to, I want to take a minute and read this part of the second email that we got here, which okay. is actually from listener Dave, who just helped us flesh out our gig checklist. And Dave says, uh, I was in a band, uh, elite show band. He says that worked on cruise ships and that was the name of it, or at least that's the URL, uh, elite show band.com that worked on cruise ships and successfully transitioned to weddings. And I agree with everything you said. It's a very different mindset, not only musically, but from a business standpoint, being able to play a list of songs goes without saying the hard part. He says, I think is learning to interact with venues, planners, caterers, and families sticking to complex timelines and being aware of your surroundings in a way that is very different than during a show in a nightclub or even a festival. Everything about that business is different, starting with your promo material. He says, sure, I got paid four to six times as much as other gigs I've done, but it was a lot more work. 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 And work work is a very interesting concept when when dealing with creative people, right? You know, they don't mind the work of learning a song and they don't mind the work of painting a picture. That, yeah. that's, that's what they do. But all the things that surround it seem to be the difference between business. You know, you, it's it's like Joe versus the volcano. I know, I know, you can get the job. Can you do the? Can you job, do the right? job? Well, yeah. And even like with a wedding band, it might not even be as good as Joe versus the volcano, right? Because you got to do the work to get the job, right? Yeah. What you described as the house rockers doing weddings, like that is the. I think that's the. That's the bait and switch that happens to us as bands, right? We play a couple of weddings because we've had some local success. People know our name and they invite yeah. us to play a wedding and then we go play a wedding, but we show up there and we play it like we play every other gig. I mean, we will be sensitive to the fact that it's a wedding, but we're playing, we're approaching it like a gig and not like we're there to MC a, and, and provide support for a wedding. And and that's the thing that makes you say, "Oh, we could do more of this, right?" Like, like my my uh, not my first gig. Well, first you, well, what you say is, we could do a more of this, and we don't have to do any more work. Right, you know, that's right. That's that's and, the catch. And then you start to throw your hat into the ring, and first of all, you don't even realize. You, 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 well, the first thing you realize is you don't know where the ring actually is, and you definitely don't have a hat to throw in it, right? And that's when it's like, eh, what do we do? And and this is why I think most bands fail and will fail at transitioning to being a wedding band because you, you, your approach need it. Like both of the stories that we've heard so far and, and that we've got a third one, if we wind up reading it all say the same thing, like the band, what, what the subtext is, is that the band collectively decided we are going to change, right? Transition means change, right? We are going to become that thing. Essentially, we're going to start from scratch with the same members that were in this band. Even if you don't change the name, you know, we were in bar band and we're going to create with the same members, a wedding band. And that's the only thing that's the same, right? Is the people. Right. And so I, I have... I have a, um, I have a question to ask you, Paul. Yeah. Do you, what is a wedding band? And I know I'm setting you up here, but, but, but well, bear with me on this. To me, to me, what a wedding band is, is a band that um, has its uh, wedding business act together. So you have promo materials, you have, you have a song list that is, is, you know, wedding appropriate, which typically means more top 40 for whatever that is. Most of the people getting married probably, you know, are going to be in their twenties or thirties. And so music that resonates with them, you have those types of things ready. Um, you are able to do a variety so you can play for grandma and great grandma and sure. you know, those types of things. So you can do those types of things. You dress appropriately. Um, you market appropriately. You spend time and money 
to um, attract it. So that, you know, Brian referenced going to wedding fairs, doing showcases, those types of things. That to me is a wedding band. It is a full-time job, but the good ones work every weekend at that scale. You are making full-time job money. Absolutely. Um, So I asked you a question and I I appreciate you trusting me with your answer. Uh, I asked you, what is a wedding band? And you gave a definition of wedding band and it is not incorrect, but it is It is also wrong because in terms of the business that we're talking about here, the most important definition of a wedding band is the thing that the groom puts on the bride's finger that day. That is a wedding band. And the, and the reason I I say it this way is we need to remember as members of a wedding band that not one part of the day is about us. About you, yeah, it is, great. and and so like for, to take the house rockers, like you are a band that's about the house rockers. You guys have your own image. Your show is about you, and you do so smart. You do a great job at that, and you are going to have to abandon that identity when you walk into a wedding hall. You're going to have to abandon that identity when you pitch yourselves to a wedding hall for these things because. It can't be about you. You need to be the MC. You need to, at times, you need to lead the, not, you're not going to officiate the wedding, most likely, but you are going to be the one that, you know, most likely introduces, you know, grandma and mom and dad and granddad and, you know, that whole thing. But it's not about you. It's about them. Well, 100% of the yes. time. <laughs> I will, I'll, I'll say 99.75, and I'll tell you why. Okay, remember, there, there's, there's, there's often many answers to of course. a similar question. Of course. I would say that, yes, what we need to do is we need to take the house rocker model and subjugate it into a process that make, they're hiring us because they want to say they have the house rockers at their wedding, right? There's certain parts of, of us, but that still doesn't mean that we dress like we do for our you know club dates or anything like that. Sure. We do dress for our weddings. However, there is a little bit in our situation being fairly well known in our area that when people hire us, they're not only hiring us for nameless entertainment, they want a little bit of that value of, of, of it being uh, a memorable, you know. I think you're not wrong. They're not gonna hire Hugh, Huey Lewis in the news to play their wedding because they can't afford them, but they might if they could, if they loved Huey Lewis in the news enough and they wanna enjoy it. So you, you may think I'm wrong, but I, I'm just sharing from the experiences no. I've had. Well, but that's what I'm saying is- I've asked people. You're not playing three weddings a week. Like there no, no, are, no. there are not three weddings a week for the house rockers to play. You're if, absolutely right. You what know I'm, what I mean? What if, you, is, if you want to become a wedding band, you need to know that at most of them, 99.9% or even 99.5%, it's not going to be about you. The ones that are that you're totally right. If somebody's hiring you because you're the house rockers, that's very different than hiring a wedding band. Right. Right. So I, I'm going to agree with you that. That a wedding man that goes out and wants to play three weddings a weekend all year long has a much different business model. And we will not be that, you know, just because they want the house rockers. Clearly, been doing this for 22 years. We have, you know, the most we've ever played is maybe eight weddings in a year. And, you know, that's that's the most. But if you want to be a wedding band for hire, you do things, you know, like um, you, you, uh, you build your business around making money off of weddings. So, like, some guys rent stages, some guys rent lights, some guys do DJ services, you know, those types of things you add to your list of services, but your premise, I will validate entirely. Your entire purpose for being is to be at the service of that bride and groom. And that's what you're, that's what you're, that's what your focus is. That's what you're there for. Be that's at, right. Be at the service of the event. That's I do it. want to read, you know, the, very close to Brian's all-time greatest email right behind would be um, Matt Burke yeah, um, from the band Foreign Architects. I'm just going to take a little bit of his email. Please. Every wedding we do, there's usually an email trail of anywhere from 10 to 50 emails back and forth for months. A face-to-face meeting or phone calls with the client, special off-repertoire requests to learn for the day particular run sheets uh, to adhere to songs and play at certain times. And in the end, I decided that going all in on this was going to produce the extra income, but exchange for a lot of extra stress and a lot less time to do meaningful things due to the prep time expected. 
Nobody mind. This is the best. Nobody minds if I screw up the lyrics to Wonderwall at a bar on a Saturday night. But the thought of a battery dying on my guitar as the bride is walking down the aisle or performing an unfamiliar first dance song keeps me up at night in the build up to them. So for now, I'll focus on being a great bar band and taking the weddings as they come. Which I think That's a lot it. of people do it again, but but he's he's re he's just saying the same thing as Brian said from a different yeah. angle. Right, being a wedding band is a is a lot of work. It is a different thing than just taking the gig. It's a different thing than just asking for the gig. If you want to be a band that you know literally, and you know people make a living. You know that you, you know bar bands are kind of side money for most people. Right, right. But but you know special event bands. Wedding bands, you know, if you're all in for that, and the thing is, you know, those are the bands that get the referrals because someone getting married who's at a wedding sees another band and they're perfect for a wedding, right? That's it. Like, yeah, the the, the, the events, number of times when, the event venues and the the wedding planners are often the ones that are selecting your bands for you, right? Yeah, so you, it's a whole they, ecosystem. Yeah, that's right. And if you if you do well for them once then they will remember you and call you. And if you don't, then you better do well for a different planner because that's the one that's going to call you. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So work is the, is the thing that has been the common theme in, in the various emails we've gotten. They've, and they've been just so thoughtful. Um, well, work and willingness to, to let go of what you need out of the gig other than money. Right. Like that, the, like that whole thing where you said, you've got some guys that say, I, it doesn't matter what I wear as long as I play well. I mean, it's that, that again, I would argue that's never true, but certainly if you're going to be in a wedding band, like that kind of, that kind of thinking can't even walk in the door. It will not yeah. work. Right. Like you're, that's immediate friction that that simply doesn't need to be there it, it, because it means that you're on a different page. And that's look, yeah. nothing wrong with being on a different page, but don't try to be in a wedding band. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we started this conversation because I said, here's what I think the house rockers are going to aspire to. And, you know, I kind of had a sense of that and, you know, that, that we have some, we have some conceptual barriers. Everybody in the band certainly wants to make wedding band money, but is everybody in the band willing to do these other things? Yeah. Right. Um, and, and you can play are- in a wedding band without doing all the work. I, I mean, take Uptown Celebration. Now, right now, Uptown is in, we're actually discussing what the future of Uptown might look like, and it might involve a division of some of this labor. However, when I joined that band, uh, and it would mean a division of, of the management fees too, of course. But yeah. when I joined that band, it was like, you're Dave the drummer, and that's your job in this band. And so, yeah. okay, great. Like, And I, this is what we will pay you. I'll tell you what we're getting from the wedding and I'll show you what the breakdown is because that's how Gary is. But don't expect that you're going to get one fifth or one sixth of the overall take because you're not doing all the work that it takes to get to the point where you get to load your drums in your own car and drive them to the wedding venue. Right. Like that. And it's like, yeah, I totally on board. hundred percent. No problem. But it like it's possible to be in a wedding, but you have to play the role of Dave the drummer in a wedding band. And, and that role involves taking out the first word. I am the drummer in a wedding band. It doesn't matter yeah. that my name's Dave. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, it goes further, right? So it definitely goes it, further. Yes, for sure. Well, it goes to, it goes to your understanding of the role. It understands your commitment to not screwing around with time in any way, shape or form, mm-hmm. not feeling you have to, you have to, everybody gets to impose their artistic will on this. It goes to, you know, dressing and, and I'll, you know, we have some guys, I've played with guys who um, are fantastic players. They're very poor. And, you know, in order to play a, a gig, a, a formal-ish gig, they, they go to, you know, Goodwill or something like that and get a suit that doesn't fit. And, you know, that, that's not going to get it done in general for a wedding band, unfortunately. It goes to not smoking on stage. It goes to <laughs> a lot of things, right? Yeah, I, like that. It goes to not drinking on stage. Yeah, usually. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it goes to not drinking at the gig. Like the band yeah. is generally, and, you know, there are some weddings where, you know, the rules are different. But the default rule is you, you don't ever go to the bar at the gig. Right. Never. Never, never, never. It goes, it goes to keeping your jacket on 
you know, for the whole set. Right? It does. It yeah. Yeah. To, you know, Depending on what your band's uniform is. Yes, that's correct. That's right. Yep. But yep. that's what I'm saying. Even within just being Dave, the drummer or the drummer or the guitar player, there is a whole lot expected of you that is out of the comfort zone often. And it's when it's when playing music becomes a job, yeah. you know? Um, and again, yeah, the one guy who does the 10 to 50 extra emails and meets with the client and deals with all of the logistics stuff, the logistics stuff. Cause I'm, you know, my personal background never bothered me cause sure. I'm pretty, you know, you know, that's, that's what you do. That's your very, thing. Yeah. Very clear about what, you know, what you get and, you know, very clear about what costs extra money. And, and, uh, you know, if you draw the line about, you know, if you ask for more stuff, it's going to cost more money that usually takes care of a lot of the, you know, can we just have, can we just do that? You know that. So the ability to be clear up front, I've always found in yeah. event planning has been a pretty you know useful tool, but even just being the, the, in the band, there is a lot. You have to take really good pictures to get, you know, yeah. sustained. You have to have a great video to, to make sustain. That's different than, you know, for most bar bands. Uh, and again, this is in no way a knock on our band. I'm, we're only saying it's a different thing. It's, it, it is and, a whole different thing. Yeah. And it's independent of your chops. I mean, chops in both cases are important. And, you know, hopefully if you're a good bar band, you've got great chops. And if you're a good wedding band, you've got good chops, different types of chops. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's what struck me. Like we got so much email about this and the, and the constant theme was we made that transition. Let me tell you. Let me tell right? you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, it's, and it's not just waking up one day, which I think is what I implied when I said yesterday. And I, and you know what, it actually, this has opened my eyes tremendously because what it meant to me when I said it to you a couple of weeks ago was, yeah. all right, I'm going to um, get us registered on the sites. I'm going to, you know, find out about bridal fairs and, um, you know, take a table at a couple of bridal fairs a year. And uh, we're going to get our act together and get a better video. And, uh, you know, we may add a, a female singer for weddings and those types of things. And all those things are yes. That's table stakes, but, though. <laughs> that's it. Yep. That is so it, man. That is so it. Yeah, it's like, great, cool. So you have a, an inkling of what the first 5% looks like. Awesome. Like, yeah. great. You're At least you're on the path. Like, awesome. That's right. Yep. If, if, it, it is. If it's you, a different philosophy. I've, I've done that and because uh, we started doing it with the responders, and we got our lunch eaten at the first bridal fair thing that we went to. It was like, oh, we are so out of our element here. Like, uh oh, <laughs> but you know, it's enlightening in, in a, in a very sort of honest way. Um, in a way that you say, you never forget the, um, the <laughs> speaking of things you never forget. I know I've told this story here before, but when he, uh, when Matt, sorry, uh, in the most recent email mentioned, you know, the the pressure of playing, the you know, screwing up the lyrics or the guitar battery dying or whatever, uh, when the bride is walking down the aisle or the first dance song reminds me of a wedding that I played a couple of years ago with Uptown. And it, I, I don't remember the name of the song, uh, but I remember listening to the song. It was the first dance. It was the, the mother son dance. Uh, and it was, you know, I listened to the tune and it was like, okay, I get this tune. I listened all the way through. There's no breaks. Okay, great. There's a little harmony I need to learn to sing, but I, it was sort of an obvious harmony. It was this country tune. I'm like, okay, great. I put the lyrics on my iPad and the, the, the most important thing I put on the top of the thing was guitar starts come in after two bars. Great. Okay, cool. Guitar player turns to us because he's the band leader and it's time for, for us to play this song. And he's like, go. And I'm like, you start this. He's like, you got to count it in. And I'm like, I have no idea how this song goes. Like none whatsoever. So I started playing like a little like shuffly kind of thing. And our bass player looks at me. He's like, are you right? I'm like, I don't know. And then the guitar player starts playing and the, our singer starts singing. And it was obvious that it was a straight groove, not a shuffle groove. And so we all adapted and started playing the straight groove. I don't think the, the mother, son, or anybody else in the room knew it. But talk about a moment of panic, like, uh oh, we get one chance to get this right. And, I, you know, it, even though it wasn't my fault, it was my fault, right? Like, I should have written yeah. down what it was just in case. <laughs> well, yep. I mean, this is the thing. These is, are the moments is, you don't forget, is, though. Yep. But, but it's like, it's like um, Matt said, you know, if I forget the words to Wonderwall in a bar on a Friday night, but 
you really have to take to heart. This is these people's wedding. They're it's starting a special day. It is a, the most important day of their life, right? Yeah. You are there to make it more memorable and not screw up any part of it. There is zero, whatever, whatever space you give yourself in a bar gig, you can, you don't give yourself in this type of playing. No. I mean, it, it, it literally, you never, remember, Remember when we had that conversation, you said your buddy who who uh, who sang uh, for Van Halen for half a tour or something like that. And he's it was like, a full tour, but, but yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. might be the song that someone paid 200 bucks to get in to see. And so, you know, you don't, you don't F with that, right? You don't screw it up. Nope. That's why you yeah. have the, that's why you have the, that's why you prepare. And that's why you have the teleprompter and that's why everything. That's right. Y yeah. Cause it's then, not the, about the, you. Although that gig arguably was way more about Gary than a wedding is about me. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, and then the thing is, if you go to, uh, if you ever see a great wedding band, like, like y they're pros, right? You know, they, they are pro pros. Yep. And I'm thinking about, you know, one that I went to, they have their audience stick together. They have their chicken dance together. It's not a rock band just, you know, mocking, you know, oh, we're going to do this today or how, how ironic, you know, you know, this band that's great at playing Iron Maiden is now going to play the chicken dance. It's not that. I mean, they're all in on the line dance. They're all in on the money dance. They're all in yep. on grandma's dance. Right. I mean, it, and you feel sort of like every, every <laughs> they're sound they're good at. Making I, I'm, you, I'm thinking about the best one I made. They're good at making okay. you believe yeah. that every, every moment of every song matters. Right. That's the it key is, is, is communicating that this matters and it's not a joke. That's right. That's, that's yep. the, that's the trick right there is being pros. Yeah. 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 I saw this, I'm thinking of my, my brother-in-law's wedding, which is the most recent wedding I've been to. It was about a year, well, other than the ones I played, obviously, but it was about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago. And uh, we, our table was, they asked me if it was okay, or they asked us, and we were like, of course. They put our table sort of to the side of the, the band, and it was like, yeah, cool. And watching them, not from the front, but from the side and how they communicated with each other, like it was so obvious that they were playing the, you know, the first dance and this, that, and the other thing for the first and potentially only time. Like the iPhone was there with the lyrics up the sure. right. You know, it was like, uh, and they were not like engaging the crowd. They were watching their sheet music and getting through the song. It was like, and I, and you know, I could look and look at the crowd and it was like, look, nobody cares because no one's watching the band. They have no, I'm the only one watching the band to see how they're getting themselves through this. Everybody else in the room is watching, you know, the, the mother and son dance as they should be like, cause that's what this moment's about. And the band played a perfect rendition of the song that was, you know, one notch up from wallpaper so that it was well delivered, but certainly not attention getting right. Yeah, and, yeah. and there's moments in a wedding where you should, as the band, get the attention of the room. Like you need, it is your job to put the energy in the room so that people are up and dancing and, and you have to, but you have to be super aware of when it's time to pull that back and when it's time to turn it on. And you have to be able to do that at the flip of a switch. And that, you know, that that's just one of those things that, that you have to learn to be a good wedding band is is exactly that wallpaper to rock star in a moment's notice. It's fun, but yeah. it's not easy conversation. Great yeah. Feedback. Fun stuff. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for your emails. That's um, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. If you have more to add or questions to to, sh to share about other things or uh, anything else we talk about or anything we haven't talked about that you want to, uh, that you want to ask us about. So, yeah, I'm down. it's good. That was a lot. I don't have anything else. Do you have anything else? No, that was a lot. Very emotional. <laughs> it was, well, it was a very like dense conversation. It was good. Yeah. All right. So you're free to use my line folks. Ask people what is a wedding band and then you can tell them. So there you go. Uh, that's it. We'll see you. Uh, we'll see you on Monday. We got Brian Geller from uh, the Atomic Punks Van Halen Tribute Band and Ultimate Ooh. Ears coming on the show. So looking forward to that. Good. Always be performing, Dave, especially Always, at weddings. Especially at weddings, unless you're not supposed to be. Right, there you go. <laughs>